uh, Corner is the post quantum cryptography group uh, project, and there's about 15 of us there. Okay. So this is a significant commitment from the cryptographic technology group to this project. So why are we doing this? Um, so in the early 80s, uh, the foundations for quantum computer were laid out by physicists, Feynman and Manin, among others. Then about 10 years later, um, Peter Shore kind of surprised everybody, uh, telling us that we could actually build, in theory, a quantum computer that would um, quickly factor integers and compute discrete logs. And that, of course, uh, raised some alarms. Um, the, now, these quantum computers are very fragile. There's this, they live in this superposition of states and, and you look at it the wrong way and the whole thing collapses into garbage. Okay. Um, so it wasn't very clear even in 94 that this was a real threat. But then in 95, uh, again, sure, discovered that you could actually do what, what's called quantum error correcting quantum error correcting, okay? And that made us really pay attention because that means that we, we might now be able to have these qubits, these units of information in a quantum computer that, that last for, you know, a little bit, a, a few milliseconds, I guess, um, and that we can trust that they will operate correctly, okay? Um, uh, but, but these would be logical units, just like we don't think about the, the, um, the hardware bits in the computer, we think of the, the logical bits in the computer. Um, we can, uh, it sure showed that we could actually do this similar thing with quantum computers. Um, and that is actually the state we're in now, okay? So the, the main, uh, bottleneck with quantum computers is the, should I be talking into this? Yeah. Okay, should I start again or? Uh, okay, sorry about that. So the main um, bottleneck with quantum computers is this, the, is this problem of error correcting, of creating uh, logical qubits. And in this decade, we're, that is where we're looking at the significant advances that uh, might happen. The, you know, the, the big players in that area will be trying to build um, a few logical bits. And keep in mind that you need many thousands of them before you can threaten crypto. Around 2014 at NIST, we uh, decided that quantum resistance cryptography would have to eventually replace the uh, classical cryptography, the public key, sorry, the public key cryptography in our standards. And uh, two years later, we launched the um, process to do so. Now, quantum computers are um, decades away. They're not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, let me qualify that. Uh, quantum computers that can be a threat to, current, to, to modern cryptography uh, are likely de decades away. There, it may be that there are some smaller quantum computers that can do useful things, uh, you know, maybe within, 10 years, okay. However, um, you know, you, there could always be some surprise that speeds up this, this process, and we don't wanna be caught unprepared. Also, migration to new cryptography is complicated and takes a long time. Now, 
there are applications where we need long, ter long time secrecy. So in terms of uh, encrypting uh, uh, medical data, financial data, um, we don't want to be thinking that maybe 20 years from now somebody will be able to decrypt this stuff. Also, um, you know, every time you use HTTPS, you connect to your bank or to your doctor's office, that those algorithms are vulner will, will be breakable by quantum computers. So anybody that's right now storing those communications will eventually be able to read them. And that can be you know, a serious problem. Think, think of your kid's DNA data, for example. But uh, let's see, so Michel Mosca here in Canada runs a survey every year where he asks the um, experts, these are you know, top experts who are actually working on building quantum computers, how likely it is that uh, within the next five, 10, so on years, uh, uh, quantum computer will be able to break uh, RSA 2048 in 24 hours, okay? And um, I think the, the um, best way to look at this uh, in real time now is to look at this 50% uh, category, the orange. You can probably see it there very, uh, I think you can see it very well, okay. so. I'm going to, you know, reading this, it says like right now only four out of 40 experts think that there's a 50% chance that within the next 10 years, or five years, uh, we'll have a, a quantum computer that can uh, break RSA. Then you go to 10 years and then now about a quarter think that that's a significant possibility. 15 years, more than half now within 15, think that within 15 years uh, there's a 50% chance that uh, we have a computer large enough to break RSA. And then if you go to 20 and 30 years, then almost everybody thinks that that's going to be possible. Uh, now, uh, it's also of interest this, um, you know, 95 to 99 category, there's, uh, you can see there that there's about half the experts in the world think that within 30 years, um, there's a chance of 50% of, uh, of a quantum computer uh, breaking RSA. Now, um, I'd like, I haven't seen a survey that asks, uh, when will we have these things on our desks? Um, um, that is probably a, a very difficult question right now. Um, I think uh, these, these same people think, uh, when you ask them, you know, what resources what will that take, you envision that, and they say, well, you know, a dedicated nuclear plant, dedicated power plant for a day. Uh, plus the huge machine. So that's the threat assessment that the experts have. Okay, so because of the problems that uh, take so long to um, deploy and transition to new crypto and the problems with the store and decrypt issue, uh, we just have no, really have no choice but to transition now to post-quantum, okay? Um, let me tell you a little bit about the process at NIST. 
before this uh, process, we had uh, two competitions for AES and for SHA, and they were very successful. Um, the way that these competitions worked was we had you know, very definite criteria, and we told people this is a competition, uh, you have a very good idea of how we're gonna judge the, the, um, your entries, and uh, go ahead and send us the, your candidates. Now, with uh, post-quantum, we know significantly less than we did at the time with AES and SHA. So in particular, you know, it was not yet, it is not yet clear exactly how we measure how good a post-quantum crypto system is, how secure it is. Um, how do we measure, how, how do we assess the threats of different types of attacks on these systems? That's, that's all fussier. Although, you know, we have pretty good idea, but we didn't feel that um, committing to very particular, to very precise, unshakable criteria, rigid criteria, w was correct. So, at least the way I thought about this is, we're going to engage in a process of community consensus, consensus building. Okay. Um, now, this this was after the the Snowden. Uh, uh, revelations and, and you know the, the world cannot be just asked to trust us completely, right? Trust that we're doing the right thing behind closed doors. Um, so we really have to um, do this in a, a transparent process, in a transpa transparent way. So that's a central objective. Everybody should know exactly what we're thinking, what we're doing. Um, to date, we have concluded three uh, phases, uh, each involving the, the, basically the whole world. Okay. Let me show you a little bit of the, um, the timeline for this process. So in 2016, we published the criteria and the requirements. Uh, next year, we got about 80, over 80 submissions. And uh, we, after reviewing those, we determined that 69 of those submissions were complete and proper. So those 69 went on to the first round of the process. And in 2018, we held the first uh, standardization conference for PQC. And uh, the year after, we, so in that conference, all 69, uh, submissions, submitters were invited to present their stuff. Uh, the first big cut was in 2019. We announced that there would be, that 26 out of those 69 uh, candidates would advance to the next round. And we held the second uh, conference that year. Then in 2020, we announced that there would be um, seven finalists and eight alternate candidates. Uh, there you see that, that us not having committed to a very precise competition process helped because you can see that there's some hesitation in our decisions there. We, we chose these seven, but you know, just in case we're gonna keep these eight uh, other ones still, still in, 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 the, in the process. The third conference was in 2021, um, and the choices for um, the st for standardization now uh, happened uh, in 2022. So we expect to release the draft standards um, for public comment in um, a few months from now. 
and we publish the and we expect to publish the first set of PQC standards in 2024. So here's what the what the chosen algorithms are. So we have one uh, key encapsulation mechanism, uh, which is Kyber, and it is a lattice-based uh, algorithm. And then we have three uh, uh, signature algorithms. Uh, we, uh, two of them are lattice-based, the lithium and Falcon, and we have a hash function-based uh, Sphinx, Sphinx Plus. Later, I will you know, show you some of the performance uh, profiles of these algorithms. Kyber and the lithium are our recommendations. Basically, we're saying these should be the work workhorses for chem and signature. Uh, the uh, Falcon is, is there because it has um, slightly different performance profile that might fit in, in some applications. And Sphinx is there because it is a hash function base, so uh, it is something that um, can be considered as a very uh, safe alternative. So there's nothing new in, in, in Sphinx Plus. It's, it's based on old cryptography that we know we've had for many, many years. Okay. Uh, however, Sphinx Plus has a you know, large, you, you pay a very large price for using that. We also have uh, three chem key encapsulation mechanisms that are still under consideration. There's classic MacLeese. Uh, it's based on codes. It has a conserver security and huge public keys. And then we have bike and HQC, which are based on structured codes, and they have some useful performance profiles. So those are still under consideration for Kim. With signatures, um, so we have one hash base, which is slow, and then we have two other which are relying on structured lattices. And we're not happy with, you know, with, with having all our, uh, putting all our egg, eggs in the lattices basket. We'd like some diversity. So we've issued um, a new call for signatures. It's a non-ramp, and the deadlines for submission is coming up soon, June 1st. And we're most interested in general purpose signature schemes, which are not based on structured lattices. So the algorithms that, um, the, the candidate algorithms all are parametrized for various security levels. Um, we created five um, security levels in this process. Uh, the levels one, three, and five uh, relate to AES, uh, AES-128, AES-192, and AES-256, respectively. So you know, if you're in level three, if you claim to be in level three, you have to convince us that it, would, that it, it is as hard as, as that breaking your algorithm is as hard as breaking AES-192 via uh, exhaustive search. And the levels two and five relate to uh, how hard it is to find collisions in, in SHA. Okay. Um, some of you might be thinking, uh, well, Finding collisions by exhaustive search is just as expensive. So in SHA-256, it's just as expensive as finding uh, a, a keys by exhaustive search in AES-128. So uh, looks like 
levels one and two are the same, but uh, it, they are different when you, you consider quantum threats. So a quantum computer um, does not get the, uh, as far as we know, it, it currently does not get a square root uh, uh, advantage in, in finding uh, collisions. Okay, so uh, performance profiles. Uh, Kyber has three levels of security. Um, the public keys are, you know, roughly between uh, one and uh, one and a half kilobytes. Private keys are between you know, one and a half kilobytes and uh, three kilobytes. And the ciphertext goes from about 800 bytes to 1,600 bytes. In terms of uh, speed, uh, key gen for Kyber, you, you can generate about 15, uh, 53,000 keys per second on, in, on, in software. Uh, encapsulation, about 46,000 46, um, keys per second. Sorry, encapsulations per second. And decapsulation, you can do about 60,000 per second. Uh, I got these numbers from uh, OpenSSL Performance uh, webpage. Now, uh, going on to signatures. Uh, so, the lithium, so you can see, you know, very significant uh, differences here. So, the lithium, the public key is, you know, about one and a half to two and a half kilobytes, uh, whereas the the key and the public key in uh, in Sphinx is tiny, you know, 32 to 64 bytes only. Uh, the private keys um, of uh, the lithium are, you know, two and a half to five uh, kilobytes. Uh, Falcon does not have a middle level of security. Falcon has only one and five, I believe. And uh, they, um, their key sizes are between eight and 14K, the private key. And again, Sphinx have tiny uh, private keys. Now the signature, it is, you can see here why Falcon uh, was chosen. Uh, the size of the signature in Falcon is the smallest of the three candidates. So there are people, you know, for example, an E2 um, vehicle to vehicle um, uh, communications that really had trouble with the, uh, with the larger uh, signatures. So, um, Falcon is there to supply a, to, to provide an alternative for people who simply cannot accommodate the signature sizes of the lithium. And then in the, um, for Sphinx, so Sphinx has, comes in two modes, uh, S for, it's probably uh, small. I was gonna say slow and fast, but it's small and fast, okay. So, um, but you know, they're neither small nor fast, but that's, uh, y you can see here the, the prices that you pay for using uh, Sphinx. And again, the, the point of Sphinx is that you're, it's not gonna, you're not relying on any new crypto, you're relying on the security of hash functions, which is um, what you, we've been relying for you know, for classical crypto. Um, 
there, were, there was another candidate, uh, very close to Sphinx, was Picnic, uh, which used uh, you know, advanced cryptography uh, techniques from secure multi-party computation, and that had similar performance profiles. We just couldn't choose them both. Okay, and that picnic also relied only on the basically well-established assumptions. In the on-ramp, we expect to get more um, more uh, candidates under that uh, secure multi-party computation uh, model. So what happened with the signature scheme too is that some of the really uh, efficient signature schemes didn't survive uh, cryptanalysis. And in the process we learned quite a bit, so hopefully, uh, hopefully there will be uh, some solid, very efficient signature schemes coming on, up on the on-ramp, but we don't know that for sure. Okay, so uh, for um, signatures, the, the uh, speed of, of, of these algorithms, you can see here that, again, uh, you can sign uh, about 35, you know, between seven and 35 um, messages per second on, on Sphinx. So that's very, very slow. Uh, the lithium is the fastest. You, you can go from uh, between 10K or 5K signatures per second. And verification, again, is fastest on the lithium, 29 to 10K. Uh, but the, and Falcon has a uh, slightly slower, uh, slightly uh, slower uh, speed. And key generation in Falcon is also very slow. You can see it can generate 113 uh, or about 40 in level five. I'm not sure which is exactly the, um, the parameters of uh, the, the parameters of that are more important to this community. I don't know if you do need to generate keys very fast or do you need to sign very fast or or verify very fast. That's um, again, I can just declare I'm, I'm a mathematician, so I don't need to know that. <laughs> okay. Um, so there are a number of other topics. I wasn't sure I was going to have time to discuss them, but uh, Maybe if I finish a little early, you can, I can take questions. But so there are, there's a lot of discussion about hybrid modes. And I should tell you a little bit about wh why that is. What, what's the rationale? So rationale is that um, more importantly is that the there may be implementation issues with the new crypto. So it's not that I, I, we, you know, it is very unlikely that lattices are going to be broken. But particular implementations of, crypt, uh, uh, of these standards may have uh, security issues. So if you rely on hybrid modes where two things need to break, you do, you do better. How long do I have? Uh, Okay, good. Um, the, there's been a lot of discussion about patents, and I was very surprised this morning. I went to look for the, 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 the patents uh, statements, you know, exactly what is the, is the status of patents that, uh, that in, uh, affect uh, Kyber. And I had trouble finding it. Uh, so uh, this, this slide deck uh, that will be uh, distributed has clickable links. So if you click on this thing, you'll see the, you'll get the, the PDF where the, 
uh, NIST uh, lawyers have uh, composed something in legalese. I can't, I'm not sure I can follow that, but uh, you, you might be able to. Um, the also, so some large companies have come to us and said, you know, we really need to talk to your lawyers about this. And we're open to that, so you can reach us and we can try to uh, uh, accommodate you there. Now, implementations will have uh, side channel vulnerabilities. That's, you know, that was the case with AES, with IRSA, and it's going to be no different with the uh, new crypto. Uh, and NIST does not, um, we, don't, we don't work on um, providing, uh, on, on researching how exactly do you need to implement these things so as to not have uh, side channel vulner vulnerabilities. That's done uh, by, you know, community of researchers and industry. So it, when, you, when you implement these things, you, you might, you, you should assess whether your particular application is, uh, whether side channels might be a, an issue there. And notice that the main issues are with, um, not with timing attacks, but with uh, power, uh, power traces. NCO, NCCOE, which is uh, not uh, in our, in our uh, division, uh, has issued uh, and will be issuing migration guidance. And that's a clickable link, so you can go and see documents about migration there. NCCOE is the National Center. Boy, I should know. Okay, I don't know. Um, there's another issue, too, that sometimes come up is uh, Grover in, you know, in the 1990s um, came out with this algorithm that basically says, look, look at any black box function and, and suppose that that function has a secret of size n and it would take you two to the n uh, guesses before you, you find that secret well, with a quantum computer, you can do roughly two to the n over two, square root of that. So, and that would impact, you know, not, not just public key crypto, but private key crypto. You know, AES is such a black box, and if somebody tells you that, you know, you can, you can recover an AES 128-bit key with 60, two to 64 operations, then, you, then that's a significant concern. Um, but the... Grover's algorithm is, you know, th there's large constants involved, and we don't currently see it as a as a threat to uh, private key crypto. So we haven't, we don't, we're not planning right now to extend uh, our key sizes in response to the threat of Grover's algorithm. So thank you. Um, we're really grateful that. This has been a long process, and we're grateful for m tons of people that have put enormous am amounts of work here. Uh, I'm providing the PQC webpage here, and there's a forum where there's a lot of discussion. Sometimes, you know, it's an open forum, so sometimes it's not as civil as we'd like it, but um, uh, it's usually very good information there. And you can always reach us uh, at this email. Thank you. Thank you, Renee. And uh, please have a big applause. Thank you. Oh, that's right. So that was a uh, great set of information. Uh, I hope that people could follow it and that it was very informative. We have a few minutes left before we are going for a 15 minutes break. And um, then we ha will have uh, Mike Answort, um, presenting about the uh, standardization activities that are happening in the IETF, the Internet Engineering Task Force. Um, I think that would be a very interesting talk as well. But in the meantime, is there anyone here in the room, or maybe remote, that would like to ask a question to Renee? Um, we will also have a panel discussion later on, so you can quiz him then. 
But uh, if there are any questions, we have a question there. There we have a mic in the front here. So if you can come up, then uh, people can see you and hear what you have for an interesting question for Renee. Please state your name uh, before asking. Turn on, sorry. Hi, Tech. So my name is Ed Joskovicius. I'm based here in Ottawa. I work with the federal government downtown. A uh, question about the performance of the CHEMS and the signatures. Um, that's presumably based on running software on existing hardware. Yeah. That's so if yes. I think that Moore's Law hasn't come to a complete halt yet, what's NIST's expectations with those performance numbers in two years, four years, ten years, et cetera? Is that being factored into your decisions on algorithms and parameterization? Thank you. Um, thanks. Uh, that's a good question. I, 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 only, I can only guess an answer. Um, I think most of my colleagues would, would agree that we're only likely to see uh, incremental improvements in both software and hardware from now on, that, that the bulk of the optimizations have been done uh, there are some issues about uh, algorithms that, that, that don't depend on actual optimizations, but whether or not you can use uh, hardware, hardware uh, support from the, you know, from the chips. Uh, but basically, only incremental uh, improvements from now. We have another question. Mike Ellsworth, and Trust. My question is about smaller parameter sets. So I've heard rumors that you're considering Sphinx parameter sets that will have less than two to the 64 maximum signatures. And also the TLS working group wants, you know, really, really, really small dilithium, like a level 0 0.2 dilithium to make it fit with, you know, really short key lifetimes. Are those being considered? Um. Yes, there's extensive discussion both internally and uh, in the forum about this. Uh, we're leaning towards not including those versions in the standards for a number of reasons. Uh, uh, we don't, some of this boils down to we don't want to give you something, uh, promote something with, w with which you can hang yourself, right? So if we, if we allow you to have you know very short num very small number of maximum uh, keys um, it's somebody will 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 exceed that and, and create a big mess um, and uh, we perhaps in many years from now after we've we've uh, studied um, uh, lattices for long, long time. Maybe then we'd feel a little bit more comfortable about uh, using uh, version 0.00 or 0 0.01 of uh, the lithium. But right now, I don't think we're going to go there. Okay, so um, I saw we have a question in the chat. Yes, the question is, would you see practical approach for the new algorithms in the existing hardware? have a similar question, so. The question, uh, Would the you see particular approach for the new algorithms in the existing hardware? I'm not sure I understand the question. You Would you see uh, particular? Approach. Uh, approach for, for the new algorithms in the existing hardware. Uh, follow up is if we have to reconfigure all libraries, all hardware, to accommodate the new algorithms, then it is not practical, possibly very costly for all of us. I see. Um, yes, that, that would be very costly, and we hope that you won't, uh, you shouldn't need, it, need to do that. Well, I, I saw Mike in, 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 in the back also nicking from agreeing that this might be a, a big challenge. And so it's definitely something we can follow up later in the, in the panel discussion. Uh, I thought we had one other question in the chat. 
Following up with it, uh, when can we expect signature al uh, aggregation algorithm for, sorry, for the dilithium cryptography? When can we expect signature a aggregation algorithm? I think I, under I, I know what that refers to, um, but that is, if I understand what that is, that would be outside uh, our our you know, project. So that would be something that would be created uh, after the standard is in place by uh, implementers. Um, so we have one more question from the, 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 the room. No, that's fine. So not from the chat. One more question from the room, and then we will break uh, for, for coffee. Um, and if you have any more questions, please hold them because we will have a follow-up panel discussion where we can address all those questions to Renee and the other panelists. Hi. Yeah, so I'm John Gray from Entrust, and my question is about, uh, you mentioned uh, the standards becoming available in 2024. Um, a lot of us are trying to actually work with the algorith algorithms now, and we need object IDs, right, to work with X509 structures and those types of things. Um, and I've asked this before, but I mean, from what we're hearing, it's going to be 2024, late 2024. There's like a guideline from the, the CNSA 2.0 that says, you know, 2025, uh, we have to have um, browsers and uh, uh, web browser support and also um, the firmware and code signing. So, I mean, that timeline is very small. Like, if we don't get standards, especially for the web browser side of things, um, uh, that's, you know, maybe six months or less. I d that timeline doesn't seem realistic. So, I don't know. Just do you have any comments on that or give us an idea when we actually maybe can get these OIDs? <laughs> Yeah, that, that's one opportunity for me to get in trouble. Uh, let me, uh, <laughs> let, let me, uh, okay, here, here it goes. I, we, we're gonna come out with draft standards soon, you know, maybe in June. The process after that should not alter those standards significantly. So you, you should be able to work from those. I'm gonna get in trouble for that. But, uh, <laughs> The, the processes, there you know, legal processes and, and um, federal registry, register announcements and things, but uh, you should be uh, in good shape starting June with the draft standards. <laughs> thank you, thank you. So uh, again, a big applause for Renee and uh,